What's going on, everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review for Gothic 3, the third installment of the Gothic series from Piranha Bytes that originally released all the way back in 2006, which largely brought a close to the adventures of the Nameless Hero. However, simply put, it is a divisive game. In many ways, this game is a radical departure from the normal for Piranha Bytes, who are known for a particular style of game, and while the core of some of that is still in Gothic 3, it is very different in comparison to many of their other titles. In some ways that are good, and some ways that are pretty terrible, which we'll obviously get into, but first I want to kick this video off with a little bit of history about the title itself. For starters, the release of Gothic 3 was notoriously buggy, more so than normal even for these types of games, because shortly after the game's release, Piranha Bytes and their publisher at the time, Joe Wood, which is a now defunct company, had quite the dispute, which ultimately led to them parting ways. Because of this happening after the release of Gothic 3, that game was left in a state of disrespect repair, frankly, because Joe Wood retained the rights to Gothic for a set period of time following this split. And, as is the usual case with things like this, Piranha Bytes were no longer allowed to work on the title, even if they wanted to, which, while I can't confirm, I would suspect they probably didn't, given that it would simply profit Joe Wood. So what Joe Wood did is, rather than hire another team to do this, they just released the development tools to the community, which led to the results of a lot of community fixes for the game. And thanks to many dedicated fans, Gothic 3 is still playable today because of their hard work. Because if the Gothic series is known for anything, it is a dedicated set of hardcore fans. Now that brings us to perhaps the most important section of the video, which is simply how do you get this game running? Because if you simply buy this on Steam and try to play it, it will run, however, once you get into the game world, you'll find that your controls simply do not work. Now, luckily, again, if you're on Steam, there's really only one thing you need to do to make the game work, and that is go to the game in your library, go to properties, and switch the beta branch of the game to the community patch, patch 1.75. Simply do that, update the game, and that is the only thing you need to do to be able to play the game and complete it. However, things do not stop there should you not want them to. There are a variety of other mods for this game, some that come highly recommended, such as the update pack and the parallel universe patch. However, I would caution you that some of these mods are exclusively in German, and many others I simply wouldn't recommend until you've played the game and are familiar with how it works at a base level. But do understand that while I will talk about a variety of things in this video, many of them are at least potentially fixed by various mods that you may or may not want to install. But again, all you need is the community patch, which also applies to the Steam Deck version of the game. Which, again, on Steam, just go to the beta, switch it to community patch, and you're good to go. Now, the very last thing before we dive into the game itself is the alternative balancing. One of the most prominent things the community patch will do for you, outside of, of course, fixing all the various bugs, etc., is alternative balancing. You see, there is only one difficulty, technically, but with alternative balancing, this will change the amount of skill points you are required to spend and obtain from various sources, which sort of forces you into a singular role, whereas in the base game, especially if you know what you're doing, you can do pretty much everything. So because of that, I really wouldn't recommend alternative balancing for most people, but it's there if you want a more challenging experience, I suppose, or at least a more build-focused one on the player's end. Though for reasons we're going to get into, I don't think it really adds much to the experience. Now from there, let's talk story setup and my thoughts on it. Point blank at the beginning here, the main story is the worst part of this game. There's other things that are bad that we'll talk about, but I was really disappointed with the main story. Now, in terms of its setup, it of course follows the end of Gothic 2, where we escape the Isle of Corinus and make it to the mainland. However, upon our arrival, we find that Zardos, after obtaining the power of Beliar, has since helped the orcs sweep through Mortana, where they now control basically everything, which sets up a lot of interesting factions related choices, especially between 
between the orcs and everyone else. However, humanity is not completely without hope, as the capital of Vingard managed to throw up another barrier similar to the one over the penal colony at the beginning of Gothic 1, and has thus kept the orcs out this way, though obviously that's only a temporary solution. Now, believe it or not, as interesting as all that might seem, none of that is the main story, really. The main story of Gothic 3 is three quests. First and foremost, we have to find Zardos, because outside of this video you might not be aware, but he's not really your enemy, especially if you watch the end scene of Gothic 2. But then once you find Zardos, he will send you on another task to go find some stuff. You'll go find that stuff, bring it back, and then you have a decision to make, and the end of the game follows that decision. However, because of the way the game is structured and everything, you're likely not to get to Zardos until pretty close to the end anyway, as he's tucked away in a pretty high level area. So you're likely to do pretty much everything else first, which means it is very possible for the first time you meet Zardos for it to potentially be the only time you need to meet him, because you might already have the stuff with you just from questing around, which means the entire main story concludes with a snap of your fingers, which is a terrible experience in and of itself. But this also leads to a sort of meandering situation around the rest of the game where it can feel a little objectiveless. As for most of the game, your only main story objective is to find Zardos. But if that wasn't bad enough, it somehow gets worse. You see, there are technically three main endings to Gothic 3, with a variety of sort of sub-endings, but here's the thing, even those can conflict with each other. Because of the openness of the game, not much of anything will lock you off from the three main endings outside of a couple of actions, which are usually related to the other endings. As such, some of the sub-area endings that you can get, based on individual people you've met throughout your journey, that kind of thing, can conflict with the main ending that you're getting. And in some egregious cases, the ending you choose doesn't even make sense with the choices you've been making up to that point. Like, it probably shouldn't even be possible, but somehow the game lets you do it. Which leads to a just very bizarre situation, and I can honestly say the main story is really, really bad. However, Gothic 3 also got a standalone expansion known as Forsaken Gods, which takes one of the endings and effectively makes it canon. But some things to know about Forsaken Gods. For starters, it's bad. The entire thing, just the quality of it across the board is really bad. I wouldn't even bother playing it. Look up a plot synopsis of the beginning of it, and you've basically figured out what it's all about. But Forsaken Gods feels like it was slapped together by someone in a level editor in comparison to the rest of the game, which probably isn't that far off from what happened given that Joe Wood had another company make that, so it's not a great experience. Furthermore, while they did pick a sort of canon ending, it does kind of seem like they picked the one that was probably the actual canon ending because Risen 1, while not officially connected to the Gothic series, does pretty much continue the story where that left off just as a bit of fun information for you. Long story short, the main story is pretty bad. I was very unimpressed with it, and it is not a satisfying conclusion to this arc at all. But all of that brings us to our progression systems. Now, as you're doing all of that, traversing the world, making all these decisions with various factions, you will be leveling up. However, this is a bit of a departure from the previous entry's approach, where you might have finished the game around like level 30, with like level 40 being the max in Gothic 1, for instance. Well, in Gothic 3, it wouldn't be unreasonable for you to hit like level 80 before the end of the game. So the power curve is much greater, and with it being the last game, I think their intention here was to make you feel very powerful, which is real hit or miss. But every time you level up, you will gain 10 learning points. You can spend these learning points points on increasing various attributes or learning specific skills. In some ways, I actually really enjoyed this system, but to break it down for you, we have six sort of attributes that we have to keep track of, as well as things like our health, stamina, and mana. But our six stats are strength, hunting skill, ancient magic, smithing, alchemy, and thieving. The important ones there are strength, hunting skill, and ancient magic, as those will dictate a lot of your damage, with the others mostly just being required for picking up particular skills, as all of those stats have minimum requirements in each to learn various associated skills. Minimums in strength to learn fighting skills, minimums in hunting skills to learn bow skills, etc, etc, you get the point. Alchemy, smithing, and thieving, you only really need about 100 in to get pretty much anything you 
want, with even some of that not even necessarily being required. For instance, I found alchemy around 50 was pretty much all I needed, because at that point I could make permanent snap boosting potions, which is most of what I wanted from alchemy. However, it's worth mentioning that none of these stats really have a cap meaning that you can keep putting learning points into the actual stat to increase it for as much as you want. So it would be a mistake, in my opinion, to put just an infinite amount of points in like alchemy because it's not going to do anything for you. Basically, what you want to do is get the minimums in smithing, thieving, and alchemy that you want, and then put the rest into the main damage attribute that you're wanting to use, which will give you some relevant damage. But in order to even do that, you do first have to go find trainers for various things, which are littered throughout the world, with some trainers being required to teach you very specific things, though they're for the most part pretty easy to find. Now, I think leads into a broader balancing issue, because a lot of these stats simply weren't made the same, which we'll talk more about in the combat section. But beyond that, I wanted to mention that there is some new stuff here in comparison to the previous games. For starters, it's possible to learn how to dual wield. Using a bow now makes you aim the bow, as opposed to just highlighting enemies, as we saw in the previous two titles. You even get some more interesting skills that allow you to knock out various enemies or one-shot them in their sleep, steal everything from them while they're sleeping, things like that, which can lead to alternative quest solutions that can make your life a bit easier. So they did add some fun stuff in there. Now, as I mentioned all the way back towards the beginning of the video, it's possible to get most everything even in a first playthrough without really doing that much min-maxing. And if you are actually trying to min-max, it's pretty easy to do everything you want to do because the learning points are abundant, and even if you don't have enough from leveling up, there's also all sorts of various interactables throughout the world that will give you extra points in various things. Completing quests will often reward points in these stats. Ancient magic you can increase from reading various tablets you can find, as well as interacting with lecterns, which also holds true for alchemy. Strength you can increase by finding millstones laying around that your character will lift up, and many other things as well. And this is in addition to the permanent stat boosting potions and plants you can find and towards the end of the game you should be feeling pretty strong. But from there let's talk a little bit about the gameplay the world and the factions themselves, as a lot of that is very different in this game in comparison to the first two gothics. As I mentioned, the main story is very light, and you are mostly just free to roam, complete objectives however you want, with you really only being limited by your ability to traverse these areas and defend yourself against the monsters therein, which in some cases can be more of a challenge than you might think. But as I mentioned, the orcs had pretty much swept through the entire land and can control most areas at this point. So oftentimes you'll go to a city, see the orcs in conflict with rebels nearby or working with their own mercenaries who have turned against their own fellow humans and are now working for the orcs, or you might even encounter the desert merchants known as the Hashishin. Most of the settlements in the area will involve some sort of conflict between two parties. You will ultimately be the decider of how that actually plays out, which means there are a lot of quests, there are a lot of solutions to many of those quests, and this is where I think the game really shines. However, I would caution you about completing or siding with one faction too much too early, because if you liberate more more than a couple of towns from, say, the orcs, then the orcs will start to find out that this is you, and they will all permanently turn hostile towards you, which can be a nightmare early game. So what you probably want to do is sort of hold off on picking sides, complete as many quests as you can, get powered up, and start picking sides towards the end of the game. But let's talk a little bit about those sides you can pick. There are ultimately three countries in the relatively large open map here, starting with Mertana, the Kingdom of the Humans, then Varant to the south, which is the desert kingdom of the Hashishin, and then up in the north we can find Nordmar, or, you know, standard Vikings, basically. Now, in each of these areas, we can side with various factions, which can grant you various benefits or cause you potential problems. However, all of this is based on the reputation system. While you can technically, I suppose, join a faction, it doesn't really work the same way it did in the previous two titles. Rather, you simply do a lot of 
tasks for that faction, whoever they might be, and this will increase your reputation. At certain reputation milestones, you can start purchasing things like that faction's armor, and completing a task for a specific trainer is usually enough to get them to train you. And because of this, there's very little limitation in the way the factions actually work, unless you pick a side too early, which means it's very beneficial to sort of just play all of the sides until your character is stat ready, so to speak, to actually start picking those sides. But ultimately, we have the orcs, the rebels, the Hashishin, the nomads, the rangers, and Nordmar at large, which is all of the clans up there. Now, each individual settlement also has its own sort of hidden reputation that you'll definitely want to keep an eye on, because a lot of that is permanent. And again, what this game does really well, in contrast to what it does poorly, is this system. There's actually a lot of choice and consequence with how you deal with these factions, how you deal with each individual settlement, what siding with one faction too much will cause in terms of reactions to you. And that is the bulk of the game, is dealing with these individual settlements, solving these disputes. So while that is a really good experience, it can often feel a little objective list, like you're kind of missing the plot because your only objective, main story-wise, is to find Zardos, which you may or may not be having any luck with. And then you combine that with just even exploring out in the world, and it can be a pretty rewarding experience when it isn't at odds with our next subject, which is the combat system. Now, in contrast to all the positives I just laid out, the combat is wildly imbalanced. Some of the mods do aim at fixing this, at least to some degree, so your exact mileage may vary on this one, but by and large, all the various types of combat were simply not made equal for a variety of reasons. For starters, if you want a more difficult challenge, I would pick melee in combat, because you're likely to have a pretty bad time with it. Technically, melee combat is a system of blocks, parries, power attacks, special attacks, all of which kind of focuses around countering your enemy. And one-on-one, -on -one, that mostly works. However, you will rarely be fighting one-on-one -on -one in this game. A lot of fights see you fighting upwards of potentially a dozen enemies in some cases, and in those situations, this sort of melee system they've built just does not work, and you'll be dead before you can even try to take a couple of swings. And that's just against regular human enemies, and that brings us to the animals. You see, animals play by a slightly different set of rules. For starters, they don't respect blocking at all. Even if you block an animal's attack, it will typically still deal damage. They also attack very quickly. They can also stun lock you which makes playing melee very, very difficult to the point where unless you have the damage to honestly just start killing things in a couple of hits, which is done by dumping a lot of points into strength, then melee is going to be a pretty bad time, which of course leaves us with ranged and magic. Ranged is pretty good, especially in the early game. It deals solid damage. It keeps you out of reach. And it's a good way to clear smaller enemies relatively quickly. There's a variety of arrow types in this game, which can even pump out some extra damage for you. And several of the hunting skills in particular offer you extra damage against, say, predator animals or orcs in particular, things like that. So ranged can be very useful, especially as an opener if you're trying to pick off a couple of enemies. But even this runs up against the problem of being outnumbered and being overwhelmed very, very quickly. Now, by far and away, you're your strongest and best option is magic. Starting right from the beginning of the game, you can start learning magic at various shrines or potentially trainers. Technically, the rune magic from the previous games has been sort of deactivated in the War of the Gods, and now we're forced to use ancient magic, which raises a bunch of questions like, if that existed, why weren't they using that instead of runes to begin with? But that's a whole other can of worms. Ultimately, though, magic is incredibly strong just because it gives you access to a lot of AoE abilities, summons to keep enemies off of you. You can put enemies to sleep, potentially, you can tame various animals. There are just so many more options to deal with various situations if you have access to magic. Some of this can be done through scrolls as well, but magic is by far and away probably the easiest way to approach the game, which is down to the number of enemies you'll be facing and the frustrating situation around animals. But you are not completely without options no matter what you pick because it is possible to recruit a variety of followers who can help you out. In some of the larger battles, you'll even have 
have multiple people potentially assisting you. So you don't have to go it alone and you can try to swing numbers in your favor a little bit and you can generally have multiple followers at the same time which is very useful if you are, say, a melee or ranged-focused character. But all of that finally brings us to our Steam Deck compatibility section, and you can absolutely play Gothic 3 on the Steam Deck. Its official rating is playable, which is because of a variety of small issues. For starters, no controller support, meaning that you'll have to map the keys out. Sometimes the button prompts in-game also don't recognize this, so that can make the controls potentially a bit frustrating. And don't forget that even on the Steam Deck, you do still need to go into the game's settings and set it to use the community patch so you can actually play the game. Though, strangely enough, it did support cloud saves for one reason or another, so there's that, I guess. So it's a bit of a clunky game to get used to on Steam Deck, but it's very much so playable on that hardware, if you should so choose. Now to wrap this up, let's talk positives and negatives. On the positive side of things, I really enjoyed all the interplay between the various factions, all of the exploration around the world to the various different countries you could go to, which brought different environments with their own cultures to learn about and deal with. And you're given a variety of tools to approach those situations, which leads to a lot of choice and consequence in how you deal with various localized drama or potentially even larger conflicts, a lot of which will have long-lasting ramifications, which can be a lot of fun to engage with. And I would say that's probably the main thing I enjoyed about this game the most, just the factions and all of that interplay between all of them, which led to some real consequences. However, this game is riddled with negatives, some I didn't even mention in in the rest of the video. For starters, the main story is bad. It just is. That was wildly disappointing. None of the endings are great, I would say. Some of them are pretty solid, I guess, but they're far from satisfying. Then we have all the balance issues I mentioned with the rest of the game. Despite them giving you so many options, a lot of them are just painfully difficult to use, which isn't even down to the skills or the playstyle themselves so much as just the number of enemies you're fighting and the sort of weirdness around animals for instance. But because of that, the game feels very imbalanced and slanted towards one particular play style via magic. And then there are parts of the game that just feel a little unfinished, and that's probably because they are. For instance, I didn't mention this elsewhere, but the desert of Verant is basically empty, which, yeah, I suppose makes for a realistic desert, but for a video game, just wandering through sand dune after sand dune isn't exactly an engaging experience. And there are little cases of things like that throughout the game, where you'll just hit certain areas that feel very much so underdeveloped in comparison to other areas. And then there is the myriad of minor bugs that still persist, just all the sort of jankiness that comes with them. Every once in a while enemies would just float away for seemingly no reason. Sometimes the camera would mess up. And all of that is a lot to get through, especially for just a regular player who isn't, say, playing through the game to make a review out of it. And that ultimately brings me to my conclusion. Gothic 3 is a janky mess with some good ideas. Good ideas that Piranobites then later took on to some of their future titles that I think are better for them. However, Gothic 3 is probably this way because of its rough launch history and all of the problems between Joe Wood and Piranobites. Ultimately, what you're left with is a product that had to be fixed by the players just to be enjoyed, kind of literally now that the game does not run on modern hardware anymore, and all of those things can make the game a little difficult to recommend. However, thankfully, because it's very old, you can regularly find this game for like less than a dollar, and the mods to fix it up are free. Given this game's history, I would recommend people give it a try. However, there's a strong chance you won't finish it. I can't really say the payoff for finishing it is really worth it. However, However, buried deep beneath that myriad of problems is an enjoyable experience. Though I imagine for most people, they will simply be content to watch a video like this and leave this piece of gaming history in the past. But that is pretty much all I've got for you guys today. I certainly hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But truly, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.